We've got a tremendous treat here today. Uh, pastor, former representative, House of Representatives from the state of New Mexico to the United States Congress, Bill Redman. Welcome him, please. All right, is that is that better? Okay, uh, glad glad. Okay, I can I can hear it now. So good morning. It's it's good to see you here, and and uh, want to thank those who uh, uh, led us in singing praises to the Creator of uh, all reality, of all things that exist. And as I said last night at Noah Webster, when you look at Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, we often forget that uh, um, the city of Colossae was known for astrology. And the stars determined their future. And people embraced Jesus, but they were bringing their past into the church with them, and there were those within the church that were still practicing astrology and coming to communion every Sunday with the brothers in Christ. And Paul had to remind them in his letter because Paul was very efficient in his words and he never wasted any space because he was directed by the Holy Spirit. And so when you take a look at the letter to the church at Colossae, those people that claimed Jesus, but yet they were still doing something else in addition to Jesus, he, said that we, he says, for through him and for him and by him all things are made, things seen and unseen. And we need to remember that that's who Jesus is. By the power of his word, the whole universe came into being. Not just our planet, not just our solar system, but as far as the telescopes can see, that that far out, just by the power of his word, that came into being. And then everything all the way down to the DNA and the molecular structure of the universe he spoke that into being. So no matter how small you go into reality, no matter how broad you go into reality, it was all there because Jesus spoke. And that word was powerful. I want to start out with a, uh, a little bit of a history lesson, and I'm going to roll the film back to before the founding of America. In fact, I want to roll it back before 1000 AD, and I want to roll it back even a little bit before that, but not quite to the New Testament. Uh, I want to tell you the, uh, the story uh, about a young man. He's about 17 years old, and uh, uh, his father was a Roman bureaucrat of some kind. He, he had an office that, you know, that, you know, fulfilling some kind of uh, uh, responsibility for the Roman government, and and uh, just like many of our American friends, that you know, he was stationed away from home, stationed overseas. Uh, he was not in Italy by Rome. Uh, he was he he was basically sent to uh, the island of Britannia, which is now known as Britain. And he was just doing his bureaucratic thing, and and he had a seventeen-year-old son, and uh, you know, the the dad was a bureaucrat, and seventeen-year-old son was just kind of hanging out and. And then uh, all of a sudden, some uh, Irish uh, slave traders, and when you read the word kidnapped in the Bible, it's not like the Lindberghs like we have. There were actually whole villages, cities, and populations where the, you know, people would come up on boats and they'd go into the city, they'd sack the city, they'd steal the, the children and the women, put them on the boats and take them away and sell them into slavery. That happened. That, in fact, that was a common thing in those days. So the 17-year-old kid, I don't know where he was, but you know, probably doing what 17-year-old kids do in Britannia. And the Irish slave traders and slave raiders pull up 
on the island of Britannia, and their boats are docked out there, and the sailors and the soldiers go out, and they kidnapped a whole bunch of people, put them on the boat, and brought them to Ireland. And some of them were brought to other places in the Roman Empire, and they're sold as slaves. And so there's one young man, he was sold to, uh, uh, inside the political structure of uh, Ireland, uh, there were all the, all of the, the, the clans had a king, but there was uh, a high king of Ireland that was kind of like over all the clans. And this one young man was sold to the high king of Ireland. And at that time, Ireland practiced abortion, practiced infanticide, women were property, they practiced cannibalism, they ate their enemies. They offered child sacrifice to get more crops. You want more heifers, you want more lambs, you want more grapes in the vineyard, you want more apples on the trees, you, you, know, you want more grain in the field. Well, we've got, to sac- we, we, we've got to sacrifice a child so that the gods of fertility will bless us. And so children were routinely sacrificed in order to have a bumper crop, and that means an economic gain. That means money in the pocket, cha-ching, if we offer this kid. And so that's what Irish society was like. And the 17-year-old kid ends up being the slave of the high king of Ireland, the whole shooting match of the island. He didn't like being a slave, because in those days, slaves were sent out to tend the sheep. And most of the times, they were lucky if if, if, if they just had some little covering around the middle part of their body. They, they didn't go out with a blanket or a robe or something to keep them warm at night, no pillows. They were just out there tending the sheep, and this kid didn't like it because, I mean, after all, his father had a government job. And a lot of people in New Mexico, we know what it means to have a government job. You get things that other people don't. And that's where this kid came from, and all of a sudden, he's not, you know, he doesn't have a flat screen back at the, you know, the, at the villa. Um, But, and now he's out there, not half naked, but mostly naked, tending sheep, and they don't smell real well. And he managed to escape. He didn't like being a slave. And as he escaped, he encountered a group of people that assisted him. Now, he was one of those typical Roman guys that trusted in Juno and Zeus and Hermes and all of the Olympian gods and all of the Roman gods and the Pantheon and the Parthenon. And he was, he was kind of like multicultural, kind of like the kids today, uh, embracing a little bit of all the gods because you want to hedge your bets because you don't know which one's really going to come through for you. And so he was very eclectic. He'd been to the academy. And so he runs into a group of people that give him sanctuary. They clothe him, they feed him, and they heal his body. And he hears about the God who made the heavens and the earth and all things therein. And by the demonstration of that Christian self-sacrifice, which is the biblical definition of love, it's not unconditional positive regard. Love is when we sacrifice ourselves for those who are in need. That's what love is. We sacrifice ourselves and put somebody other than ourselves. John defines this in John 3:16 when he said, "For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son." Jesus is sacrificed for us. He didn't do it for himself, he did it for another. And so this young man was loved by a group of Christians. Here's the gospel. He trusts in Jesus. And he realizes that all of the gods of the Greeks and the Romans are all fake. That they were made by the creativity of the minds of the philosophers. And then he has a dilemma. 17 years old. Just ran away from slavery. He could go back to Britain and 
live under the protection of the Roman law, the Pax Romana, and just stay away from the beach so that he doesn't get picked up in the next slave raid, and he could live a comfortable life. Or he could go back to the high king of Ireland, who was worshiping the trees and the stars and the rivers and the rocks and sacrificing his children for bumper crops. This young man went back. Well, what could happen? He could be killed as a runaway slave as a message to all the other slaves, right? Chances of being set free and saying, well, why don't you go home? I know you're homesick. That's probably not going to happen. Or he can go ahead and be thrown back out on the hillside with just a loincloth tending the sheep after he's been beat up quite a bit. And so he stands in the presence of the high king of Ireland. He hadn't been to Bible college. He hadn't been ordained. He didn't have a Bible, didn't have a scroll. But in his mind, he knew that one God created one creation by the power of his word, and he didn't have to fear the Roman gods. He didn't have to fear the Greek gods. He didn't have to fear the Irish gods or any other gods because there was one God and one creation, and it was that one who gave his life for him and loved him in such a way that it was well with his soul. And he stood in the confidence of Jesus Christ and he spoke the truth into this pagan culture. Holy Spirit showed up. High King of Ireland believed him. It was the end of abortion. It was the end of infanticide. It was the end of child sacrifice. It was the end of cannibalism. You want to see a revival? That's a revival. So, the other thing that they did is that they used to take skulls and shrink them. And if there was a young man that wanted to uh, marry a girl, he would have to go to the father and say, what's the bride price? And he'd say, well, i got three enemies over here. You bring their heads back, cut them off, shrink them. You bring to me, you can have my, you can have my daughter. Now, any guy today that just like complains about the price of a diamond ring, I'm just telling you, uh, the price used to be higher, okay? <laughs> and then they would take the skulls, they'd cut the back of them off, and they would use them as ceremonial drinking cups as they drank the blood of their enemies. But when the gospel came, it was all gone. That's the transformation, the change of mind where we think the change of heart where we decide, the change of behavior in our bodies where we live. That's repentance. That's repentance. But I say all of this for one point and one point alone. That when a person or a civilization gets the God question wrong, who is God? When that question is, ends with a false answer, not, fa not fake news, but a false answer, from the answering that question, the entire worldview flows into society and in the lives of individuals, and the society and the person begin to disintegrate and collapse. When we don't know who God is, we will never know who we are because we're made in His image and likeness, and knowing Him is imperative to know who we are as individuals. And so it's all about the God question. Who is God? And when the ancient Irish finally got the answer to the question, they didn't have to fear the spirits of the water. They didn't have to fear the spirits of the trees. They didn't have to fear the spirits of the wind. They didn't have to worry about any of those deities being angry with them and destroying them and messing with their lives. And they could live their lives in confidence and boldness because they knew who God is. Our founding fathers knew who God is. And they know who we are. But they didn't in Ireland. 
and they didn't in Greece, and they didn't in Rome. And there was a point then there was child sacrifice in Honduras, but the gospel's there now. But we're still doing some of those things here in America. I'm going to read a little bit from Acts chapter 17. If you have your Bibles with you, uh, please uh, feel free to, to follow along. Because in Acts chapter 17, we see a wonderful example of the Apostle Paul identifying who God is. Acts chapter 17 provides us three different models of evangelism. First, you have uh, Paul is in the city of Thessalonica, and he goes to the Jews, and they don't receive him, and he gets kicked out of the city, and he goes on to Berea, and while he's in Berea, they examined the things, and he reasoned with them in the synagogue. They examined the Scripture, and they, because they examined the Scripture, they accepted Christ. And our brother Luke tells us that they were more noble-minded than those Jews who were over in Thessalonica. So you, Paul goes to these two different groups, one that rejects him, one that accepts him, but he's faithful in presenting the gospel in both groups, in season and out of season, whether it's accepted, whether it's rejected, but he goes forth boldly because he knows who the creator of the universe is. And then he steps into an arena that's different from those two in the latter, the latter part of this chapter. Instead of talking to Jews who had the, the, the law of Moses in the Old Testament, he speaks to a people that, nah, they don't know a whole lot about Moses. And guess what? Most of the world doesn't know a whole lot about Moses. So the people that we're going to encounter in presenting the gospel, the truth of reality, of who God is and what the creation is and who we are and our dependency and need for wholeness and salvation and life because He alone is the Lord and the giver of life, we're going to, in our society and in our encounters, be encountering people more like those that were in the city of Athens. And, and I just want to let you know that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there is no word for the word atheist. Do you know why? Because every, be, every human being made in the image and likeness of God is automatically wired to worship God. And when that wiring goes haywire, and that worship gets pointed in a different direction away from God, that's not called atheism, that's called idolatry. That you have misidentified who God is. And idolatry is about the correct identification of God. If you misidentify God, that's idolatry. And so there is no word for atheist. So when I, I, somebody says, well, I'm an atheist, I just talk to them a little bit and I you know, just wait for them to say enough for me to drive a Mack truck through their argument and say, you're an idolater, you're really not an atheist. You're, let me point out what you're worshiping. But I, I, I didn't like pick that up from comic books. I, I got that from Paul here on Mars Hill. So I'm going to read Paul on Mars Hill very briefly here. And then we'll move on. Beginning in verse 16, our brother Luke records and he says, because he's empowered by the Holy Spirit and all scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit, and Luke is inspired to record this. He says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. How many here are distressed to see that the city of Albuquerque is full of idols? We better get distressed, folks. And we better know and be able to model what Paul does here. Paul understood their worldview and understood how the worldview logically collapses and could never, ever satisfy the deepest needs of their human longings. And until we understand what the biblical worldview is, and then understand the worldview of those that we're speaking, the, presenting the gospel to, we will be speaking the gospel straight past them 
to no effect to them whatsoever. And so here's Paul, and he's, he's distressed that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned with them in the synagogue. And what we have is holy, sanctified thinking. Because guess what, people? The heart might, might accept something at one point in his life, but the heart will eventually reject what the mind cannot accept. God made as an integrated whole of mind, body, spirit, and emotion. And if there's one part of our whole being that has not accepted who Jesus is, the reality of Christ, eventually our whole person will reject the wholeness of Christ. And so Paul doesn't go in there with an emotional testimony. Paul goes in there understanding what it is that they are persuaded about in terms of who and what God is and what is the universe and who they are as, as human beings. He understands that and then he moves in. And so what we see is that he's, he, uh, the city is full of idols, so he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks as well in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. And then it goes on in verse 18, it says, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers... We don't have time to go into who they were. But Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, those were the religions, the two of the main religions of the day. Uh, they began to dispute with him, and some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Now, in the Greek, that's an insult. The word babbler is uh, it's the image of a, uh, of a bird uh, flying down the marketplace, picking up a seed and flying away. And, you know, he thinks he really has something, but he's got nothing there at all. This was an intellectual insult on the apostle, you know, the apostle Paul, but it doesn't come through in the English translation. Others remarked he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. See, they thought the resurrection was a god. Well, Jesus is God, resurrection is a god, Zeus is a god, Hermes is a god. We've got lots of gods. What do you mean we, we're short on gods? We've got a lot of them. You just can't do science if every one of those gods has their own law of gravity. I don't want to live in the neighborhood where the law of gravity isn't the same as where the rest of the, where it is in the rest of the universe one god can make the law of gravity universal across the universe so then they took him up and brought him to a meeting the areopagus that's mars hill and i find it interesting that paul goes into athens to mars was the god of war okay so paul goes straight to the place where the god of war is worshiped to preach the Prince of Peace. I am so moved by that. This wasn't just a philosophical school. This was the place where the God of war was worshipped. And he comes with the shalom of Jehovah. I, I, I cry once sometimes when I read that passage. Where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting. You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we want to know what they mean. There's parentheses here. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there, they spent their time doing nothing but reading Snapchat and Facebook. <laughs> oh, did I mention Oprah? Oprah's in there. That's the textual variant. They spent their time doing nothing but talking about listening to the latest ideas. Do you know how comfortable these people would be as your next door neighbor? Or your child's school teacher? You know, or your congresswoman or congressman from, or maybe your new mayor? They'd fit right in. They would fit right in. You know why? Because the human heart has not changed since the Garden of Eden. It's the same. Dress might be different, and mode of transportation might be different, and the way we communicate with each other might be different. I'm not using smoke signals. I mean, I've got you know, my iPhone here. There, the technology might be different, but the human heart has not changed. So they, they haven't changed. So Paul stands up in the meeting of the Areopagus, and he says, now these are some of the most learned people. Never be ashamed to take the gospel in the midst of the learned people okay they're fallen sinners in need of god's grace 
That's their primary identity. Made in the image and likeness of God, fallen sinners in need of God's grace. There's nothing in their mind that can scare Jesus. And there's nothing that they can say that should scare you or me. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and he said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you're very religious. He doesn't let anybody off the hook for being an atheist. He says, you're all religious. Everybody's a theologian, everybody's religious, and everybody's a politician. I'm just telling you. Okay? Because we all have views on all those things. And there's all things that we're persuaded about all three of those topics. Verse 23, For as I walked around and I looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar to this, uh, uh, with this inscription to an unknown God. Now, what you worship is something unknown I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands and he, does not, and, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men. You see, civil rights movement didn't start in the 1950s. It's back here. The basis for equality goes back to the Scripture. There's not a single worldview anywhere on this planet that has a basis in the power to end racial discrimination. It's all here in the Scripture. Anybody that wants to borrow the ideas will fail because they don't have the basis. But we as the church have the power to break down those walls. From one man he made every nation that men, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set forth and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Isn't that interesting that the Holy Spirit motivated Paul to use the writing of a pagan? Don't you remember Abraham? What was he doing when God called him? He was pagan. Okay? You better know some pagan words that coincide with the Scripture so you can borrow on that so you have a point of common entry when you're talking to people inside another, another culture. So he goes on, it says, Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver, an image made by, and this is so important in verse 29, and it doesn't come across real clearly in the English, it says that, that we, sh um, uh, we should not think that the divine being is like gold and silver or stone, an image made by, God, by, by man's design and skill. Now, the reason I want to stop there for just a brief moment is that there's two words there, that, and, and, and you have them designed, and I just read it from the New International Version. There's the one word that is design, which is the activity of the mind, and the other is the word skill, which is the word techne, where we get the word technology from. That God is not the product of man's thinking, nor is God the product of man's hands. Do you know why God is not the product of man's thinking or the product of man's hands? It's because God's not a product at all. He's eternal. He's eternal. Now I'm going to stop right there. Go home and read the rest of the, you know, read the rest of the, uh, uh, the chapter there and you'll see a, a model for us to engage in evangelism in the society in which we live. But there's two types of idolatry that Paul identifies here. The first type is the idol that's the product of the hands. I think that if uh, Pastor Gary were to come up and put a statue of Buddha right here or a statue of Aphrodite right here, immediately you would detect that idolatry might be in this place, right? Why? Because when you see the idol, it's easy to detect and understand and respond. That is an idol of techne. 
the idols that you and I confront in our society, they are not idols of techne. There we go. The idolatry that is sweeping across our land and across the world, and it's made it to Honduras, I could be there 10 minutes and find somebody that's already subscribing to it, is a naturalistic worldview that manifests itself in something called postmodernism that denies that all truth exists. I don't care where I go or who I talk to, I can talk to your grandkids or your children and within five minutes determine whether they're idolaters or not. It is an insidious cancer that is idolatrous, that is not only in the society outside these four walls, but if we think for one moment that just because we embrace Jesus as Lord, as, though, as those uh, uh, they, that were freed from Egypt embraced Jehovah after the, the crossing of the Red Sea, if we think for one moment that the human heart is not deceitful and cannot persuade us to believe not only in Jesus and do the Jesus thing and do another thing besides God, we're fooling ourselves. The first commandment was written for all human beings because all human beings not only have the, the possibility, but we have the potential propensity to become idolatrous. The number one sin in the church is not illiteracy, it's not, you know, it's not adultery, it's not coveting, though coveting is a very big problem in the American church. The number one sin is idolatry. And if you walk away with anything when Congressman What's-His-Name leaves town, I want you to understand that if you are not guarding your heart where you decide on your understanding of as who God is, that, that having the wrong answer is going to point your life and the life of your family all in the wrong direction. And what we're seeing acted out on the television screen, not necessarily only in the movies and the television programs, but even in the news, we are watching idolatry sweep across our land. And its results are devastating. So be aware, and I'm going to make a challenge to the, and I'll, I'll just make the challenge now. I was going to wait till the end, but I'll, I'll make that now. Okay, for Gary and for the leaders, the pastors, the elders, and, you know, the leading men and women of this congregation, I would challenge you that during, during 2018, you sit down, you get David McCallum's book called The Death of Truth. And you sit around a table, you read it, and you talk to each other, and you identify this idol so that just as Paul was able to identify the idols in the book of Acts, that you're able to identify the idols. Number one, not necessarily you convert somebody who's not a Christian, but number one, so that you can, you can examine yourself to make sure that you're not committing the sin of idolatry. And then the next obligation you have from Deuteronomy chapter 6 is that when you're walking in the way night, day, seven days a week, 24-7, that you are talking to your children and your grandchildren to make sure that your children and your grandchildren are not running off and playing with Baal of our day. Because if we don't think that idolatry can't creep into our families, you don't understand the power of Satan. Because it's not flesh and blood that we battle, it's the principalities and power that come straight through the walls, into the bedrooms, into the dining rooms, into the classroom, into our homes and into our marriages. And the pastors are called to protect the flock. I tell pastors wherever I go, you know that shepherd's staff, here's a stick. You know, and up here is this little curly thing and a lamb's over there and it's getting off the cliff. You reach over with the hook and you bring the lamb and you saved him and brought him back into the fold. And I say, okay, pastor, what is the other end of the stick used for? Go back and look at David. There's a time to use the hook to rescue and bring back even members of our family. But there's times when our families are under attack and the pastors and the leaders of this church need to be able to turn that stick around 
and go after the bear and the lion that's coming to feed on our families. Because they are. The bear and the lion of modernism, postmodernism, and existentialism, Eastern mysticism, it's flooding across our land. I go to churches and I'm talking to pastor's wives who are engaged in yoga that denies the existence of God. Hallelujah, Jesus, when we're looking at the screen, but when they leave here, they're over there going, um, pastor's wives. It's in our families, it's in our church. The number one the number one challenge facing this church is not how much money you need to raise to keep the facilities open. It's not the scheduling. It's none of those things that are the superficial on the outside because down inside every human heart, Satan is working so that you can deceive yourself that Jesus is not Lord and you are God. That is a very real, present threat. And if you're not aware of it, you're not paying attention. But I would challenge this church and share it with other churches. Understand what postmodernism is. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Okay? It's one thing to know that Bible verse. It's one thing to quote that Bible verse. But do you know how to utilize the Bible verse just as Paul was able to use the Scripture when he went into Mars Hill? Are you able to understand that passage in light of the challenge of the day? Because that view, that view says that truth is absolute. George Barna, in his research in examining evangelical churches, and this is an evangelical church, Calvary Chapel branding, okay? We're an evangelical church. 70% of the adults, not the children, 70% of the adults, when questioned across this country, when they're asked if you believe, church, if, if, if you believe truth is relative, 70% are saying no. I'm sorry, if, 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 if truth is absolute, 70% are saying no. We're talking about people that are elders, deacons, you know, Sunday school teachers. They're carrying the Bible. They're getting kids memorized Bible passages. They're, they're, they're going to Christian concerts. Hallelujah, praise Jesus. I go there and I'm in tears. I was in tears this morning. I thank you for the, the praise team. It is well with my soul. Oceans. Oceans. When you guys, I don't know where you're at. Where are you? No, th okay, if I had, if I had vision, I, I could see you. <laughs> My vision's inside. <laughs> you know, you ministered to me, and the Holy Spirit prepared that. And I had to, I had to wipe the tears away, because I, you brought me in the presence of God, and, and Jesus showed me my shortcomings, and he showed me how good this grace was. And you did that. Thank you. That was a service. That was a ministry. That was an agape. But you see, folks, when 70% of the adults in evangelical churches believe the truth is not absolute, they can't say that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Satan has come in, he's in our homes. He's in our churches. He's messing with our minds. And it's having serious ramifications in our lives as they fracture and shatter because of the decisions that follow from abandoning God. Now, it might not be cannibalism, and it might not be drinking your enemy's blood. It might not be immediate slavery. It might not be any of those things that, that my Irish ancestors encountered but your lives will be just as fragmented. And only Jesus can put you back together. So the biblical view of truth is that truth is absolute because Jesus is truth. And then, following that, historically down the timeline, we've come to the era of modernism. Modernism says truth is relative. You got your truth, he's got his truth, and this guy here right here chewing gum during while I'm preaching, he's got his truth. That's okay, just keep it up. I just wish I had some. 
<laughs> truth is relative. Now, when truth is relative, you can at least maybe argue to the point that it's not relative and win somebody, win their mind. And our generation, the baby boomers, we had to deal with that relativism on the college campuses and in our neighborhoods and in our schools and in our jobs. We had to deal with that. But guess what? The younger people that are here, they're not having to deal with post they're not having to deal with modernism. They're having to deal with postmodernism. Postmodernism truth doesn't exist. And then if you make a truth claim, you're being aggressive. You've offended me. You hurt me, and I now have a grievance against you. Because truth doesn't exist. Don't make that power play on me. You hear that 11-year-old kid coming home telling you that? You know why? Because he got it at school. Just as my generation, they got relative. I, I don't understand, you know, I, I flip on the news and, you know, there's corporate ripoffs and there's adultery in the marketplace and in Congress and all. And, and it's kind of like, okay, now wait a minute. These guys went to Ivy League schools that said truth is relative and, it, and, and there's no moral absolute. And, and all of a sudden, you know, they, 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 they believe it and they behave that way. And then all of a sudden you're crucifying because they're, they're living like as if truth is relative. Why would you put them on TV and embarrass them like that? That doesn't make any sense at all. But idolatry never does make sense when you actually bring it down. So, so truth is seen to be non-existent. One more item from the Old Testament. I'm not going to read it. Everybody here, raise your hand if you know the story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Okay, so I see some hands aren't going up. I'm going to tell a story on Mount Carmel real quick, real quick. I'm not going to go through all of chapter 18 of the Old Testament. Okay, that so you've got God's people. They're living in the land of Israel and uh, they're doing the Passover and they're sacrificing the Passover lamb every year. And they're doing the Seder and the whole thing. And, and they're trusting in Jehovah and everything is real good. But the people around them, they're they're worshiping Baal. Okay, and Baal says that, uh, well, you know, if you, you know, engage in temple prostitution and other bodily acts and some other things, that, that's how you get a bumper crop. And, and so you get these Jewish men going, hey, you know, uh, I can get my, you know, my profit margins up if I uh, do this Baal thing. Okay, more grapes, more wine, more, more, more lambs. And, and so, so there they are. You got God's people. And it is rare that I hear a preacher or a Sunday school teacher or a leader in the church understand that when Elijah's on Mount Carmel and he says, okay, we're going to have a challenge. You build an altar, I'll build an altar. You put a cow on it, I put a cow on it. And whoever answers with fire from heaven, he's God. And so the Baal people, they're over there, the, pro the, the priests of Baal and... <laughs> They build the altar and they're dancing around it and, and they're calling on Baal and they're actually cutting themselves, you know, slashing themselves with razors and, you know, singing and, and you, know, you know, Baal show up and we just want to show you how powerful Baal, well, Baal doesn't show up, okay? And that goes on for a long time and, and Elijah steps on and he goes, okay, men, step aside. So he says, step aside and, and he says, put water on the cow, put water on the altar and I'm going to call on God. And he steps back because he kind of knows what's going to happen. And he calls on God and whew, the fire comes down from heaven, burns the cow, burns the rock. You know how hot that's got to be? Burns the rock. And we get, we go, okay, well, here's Baal and Jehovah, Jehovah's God. That wasn't the point. The point was that there were human beings whose ancestors were saved out of the land of Egypt. They had Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they had the Ten Commandments. And they had one foot in the Jehovah camp, and they had the other foot in the Baal camp. And they thought that was okay with God. If you think for one moment that that was okay with God, the 450 prophets of Baal were immediately slaughtered after that event because God will not tolerate in your heart two thrones. There's one throne, and it's only for Him. 
So let's roll the camera up to where we are. Do you think that you can say, Jesus is Lord and I'm postmodern and multicultural? It, it cannot happen. And it's hard for us to see that because it looks so loving, it looks so kind, it looks so tolerant, it, lo it, it, it looks wonderful, but what we're doing is that we're as bad as Peter. We're betraying Jesus and, and, and Judas. You know, we're betraying, betraying Jesus, not with a kiss, but with a translation. Because Satan's doing a Jedi mind trick on us. And it's not okay with God. Jesus bled and died. And he was spat upon. And a crown of thorns and betrayed by those who said that they loved him. And he did that for me and for you while we were yet in our sins. It is not okay with God. I've got a three-year-old grandson, and he calls me Papa Bill. I'll kill the person, he says, somebody else is Papa Bill. And why do we feel that way? Because we're made in the image and likeness of God. So what does all, all this have to do with real life? Let me bring it home. We live in America. We're Americans, and we're hearing that we need to make America great again, and that's not false. But How? What made America great in the first place? What was it? It wasn't our big economy. It wasn't our factories because th that all came at a later point. What made America great? And I'm not going to get political here. I'm just not going to do that right now. You don't have time. <laughs> America is the greatest nation that ever was, most powerful economic, most powerful um, in military might, most powerful in wealth. The world's never seen a nation like America. 21 civilizations have come and gone. You and I live in civilization number 22. And the most important question is not whether the Senate's going to pass that economic bill this week or whether Social Security is going to be here when I retire. Those are not the important questions. The important questions right now is America coming or going, because one thing I know for certain is 21 have gone. I know that for certain. But I don't know about this one that I live in. I can't be the steward of the other 21 civilization, but you and I are the stewards of this civilization. I can't preach the gospel back in the day of Abraham Lincoln. I wasn't alive, but I'm accountable for preaching the gospel in this day. So we're living in civilization number 22, and are we coming or are we going? And what made us great to begin with? I do mission work in China. We're building a seminary over in China because we're trying to help the Chinese Christians not make the same mistakes that the American Christians that, that, that we made here that's brought the decline of our civilization. Because if the Chinese Christians think that they're going to overpower Beijing with an American gospel, they're, they're fooling themselves. It's a truncated gospel. It doesn't consider the wholeness of Christ and the wholeness of salvation. And the full reality of life is who we are and made in the image and likeness of God. The American church has left that more than 100 years ago. And church leadership for the last 100 years, they've learned a truncated gospel, they've preached a truncated gospel, and we're getting truncated results. But the greatest nation that ever was comes from a faith statement. It's in the Declaration of Independence. I'm a big constitutionalist. Con and I want to restore the Constitution. I'm all for that. But you can't have the Constitution without having the Declaration of Independence. It's the foundation. The most important sentence of the most powerful document, the most important document in our civilization, is the preamble. And you know it. 
says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Did, did we just not read that in Acts chapter 17? That idea did not come from nowhere. That idea was revealed by the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Paul and by the power of the Spirit recorded by Luke so you and I can know more about the loving God that He loves not only me, but He loves every man, woman, and child, born and unborn, regardless of race, regardless of caste. God doesn't care who you know, where you bank, and how much you got. But that comes from the Scripture. And Noah Webster College is calling us back to the foundations that made the America great to begin with. And this is one of those foundational principles. There are many, but this is one of the most important. So we have this idea enshrined in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their Creator with certain, not questionable, unalienable rights. That means you can't be separated from them. That among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Governments are not instituted among men, according to the Scripture, or the American founders, to redistribute wealth and make everybody equally miserable. The purpose of government, according to Romans chapter 13, is to secure for the individual that which comes to the individual directly from the hand of God with no government intervention whatsoever. The government did not give you the right to life. The government cannot take it away. The government did not give you the right to liberty. The government cannot take it away. And the government did not give you the right to pursue happiness. And the government cannot take it away. Those come from the hand of God and the, and, the, and the biblical responsibility and the mind of God is that governments are there because sin is in the world and their, their godly ordained purpose is to secure for the people that which came from the hand of God. And so when we look at that, we go, okay, well, what's the most important word of the most important sentence of the most important document of the most powerful nation that ever existed? Is it the word life? No. Is it the word equal? No. Is it the word uh, liberty? No. Is it the word pursuit of happiness? No, no, it's none of those things. The most important word of the most important sentence of the most important document of the most powerful nation that God, by His ordination, allowed to exist on this planet is the word creator. And when we pull the word creator out of that document, there is no guarantee for life. There is no protection for liberty. And there's no assurance of the right to pursue happiness with the gifts that God has given to you and for the purpose for which you were called. All that goes away if the word creator is out of that document. But let's think one moment a little deeper. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's some people think that those carry equal weight. But think about it for a moment. It's difficult to pursue happiness if you're not free. This is yes, and this is no. Right? It's difficult to pursue happiness if you're not free. But I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, it is impossible to be free if you're not alive. The right to life is the foundational rights of all the rights that God has given to us. Abraham Lincoln in the second inaugural address, he says that God brought on both the north and south of this nation the civil war because of the violation of the right to liberty. In his second inaugural address, he says that every he says God brought this war. The North is not innocent. The South is not innocent. That this is God's judgment on this civilization. And if you think that God waits until the trumpets blow when we're all floating in clouds to judge us, I, you're you're fooling. God judges. He judged Rome. He judged Assyria. He judged Babylon. He judges civilizations right here and right now. 
And if you think that he's not going to judge America, you're smoking dope. He will. And Abraham Lincoln saw it. And he said that God's justice will not sleep. And because the nation tolerated the violation of the right to liberty, Abraham Lincoln says that God brought this horrible war. And he said, he goes even further, and he says that every drop of blood that was let by the slave owner's lash in beating the slaves, every drop of blood would be equaled with a drop of the sword in the battle until the account was balanced and paid in full. Now, I didn't live then, but I'm living now. And there is some violation of liberty, and I'm not going to deny that. But God is looking down from heaven at America, and we've got over 50 million unborn children that though they had the right to life, they were denied that life. Far more serious than denying somebody liberty. And if you think that God is going to sleep and, not, and, and withhold judgment from us as a nation because of the sin of abortion, after he punished the nation for a violation of the right to liberty, we're fooling ourselves. God's grace and mercy is on every man, woman, and child who have been caught in that hideous sin. Only Jesus can make that woman whole. Only Jesus can make that man whole that paid for the abortion or forced the abortion and the men and women that do the abortion. But God gave this congregation and other churches in this town an opportunity a couple years ago to stop late-term abortion here in the city, and over 50,000 pro-life Christians sat home and did not, go, did not vote and did not use their sanctified voice to say, no, this will not happen in this place. And there are late-term abortions in this city right now because maybe some of you and Christians that you knew, over 50,000... 50,000. And the, and the proposition was lost by about 4,000 votes. Innocent baby human beings are slaughtered in the city because God's people were silent. They had the stewardship of their voice. They had the stewardship of their vote. They had the opportunity to stand and make a proclamation for the image and likeness of God for the unborn child. And they were silent. God is not going to hold us innocent for that. God is not going to withhold his judgment for that. He is going to call us into account unless we repent. If we turn our minds where we think, our hearts where we decide, and our bodies where we live out that decision that Jesus is Lord over all things, over politics, over planets, over DNA, over everything unless we see that jesus is lord of all we are committing idolatry i want to call us to the challenge i encourage you and i challenge you as a family of jesus right here that during 2018, understand the idolatry that is sweeping through our families and understand how to speak to that idolatry to rescue our sons, our daughters, our grandchildren, and for some of us, even our parents and our brothers and sisters. Jesus died for them on the cross. And for us to be silent is the most cruel thing that we can do. So my prayer for Calvary Chapel East in Albuquerque here is that, that you can focus in on who Jesus is as the only one to worship in the whole creation and that all the other idols they're the product of another human being's thinking or they're the product of another 
human beings technology they're not eternal they're temporal but Jesus created you to be with him eternally and eternity has already started the down payment is there the forgiveness on the cross is ours the empty tomb is the invitation I'm not sure how you traditionally end your sermon time. I don't know if the musicians return. Gary? Okay. You're going to sing solo? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, even though he and I differ on many issues, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> that was a joke. If I have anything to say about it, he will be back. In fact, every week would be great. There's not many people I'd rather hear than myself, but he's one of them. <laughs> Again, I'm, I say that in jest, of course. Wow. Wow. I was blown away last night at the banquet, and I've been blown away again this morning. So what a privilege to have Bill come and share with us today. It's getting a little late, so what we're going to do, I'm going to ask the prayer team to come. Now, <laughs> please. And we'll, we'll pray. And then uh, if you need prayer this morning, and I suspect there would be some that do, in fact, we all probably do. I feel pretty pulverized right now, personally. That's a good thing. It's good when you're pulverized by the Spirit of God. But uh, then we'll, break, we'll go on over and we'll begin our potluck shortly. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this powerful message that was brought to us today by our brother in the Lord, Bill Redmond. We pray that you'd help us to take these things to heart. There's a lot to digest. But Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to work these truths into our hearts and minds uh, in the hours, days, weeks, and months to come, that this could be truly a transformative message for our church, for our lives, for our families, and that ultimately for our community, for our state, for our nation. Thank you, God, that you are not silent, that you do speak to us by your Holy Spirit, through your word. Lord, let us not turn a deaf ear to what we've heard today, but may our hearts and minds be open, moldable, teachable. And we pray for those who would be coming up now for prayer, that you would just minister to them, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon them, uh, anoint those on the prayer team to effectively minister to those who come. And we also ask your blessing upon the food that we'll be partaking of shortly. Thank you for this awesome day that you've blessed us with. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.